Good evening, Julian here from beautiful Changu, Bali with EX Venture TV. I hope you're having an amazing day, just like we are having here in Bali during the rainy season. And uh, what a week it has been. Welcome back to the program. We're going to have uh, three incredible guests with us tonight. Very diverse industries they're working in. And uh, you surely don't want to miss this. But let's get started with some updates. Tomorrow night, we're super excited. We're going to be hosting EX Venture Night from Israel for the first time with our partners from Terra Venture Partners from Israel, one of the leading clean tech um, funds out there. And we have five companies with us that we're going to be presenting tomorrow. And you should definitely tune in. It's going to be at 9 o'clock Singapore time. Uh, so it would be like 9 a.m. somewhere on the East Coast U.S. It's very, very early. But you can also you can watch the reruns, obviously, online. So just make sure you're signed up on LinkedIn to the event or on our website. And it's going to be a really, really cool event with five of the leading clean technology companies from Israel. And then on February 16th, we're getting ready for the big EX Venture Night from the U.S. and Canada. And if you want to be part of that program, reach out to us now. We're still taking applications for companies that want to be presented in front of quite a large audience of investors and partners, probably about over 2,000, 2,500 guests we're anticipating this time. So this is a great opportunity for you, and we want you to be the best entrepreneur you can be. Also, this week, super exciting. We did the pre-launch on our EX Academy. And the EX Academy, the idea behind it is that we have done now hundreds and hundreds of hours of pitches, of presentations. We have mentors on the program. And we find that a lot of entrepreneurs have a better chance raising funds. They spent a little bit of time in preparation of their pitches. And ultimately, only about 0.6% of all companies get venture funded. But we think more companies like you deserve the chance to get the funding they need to get their vision out. And for that, it's so absolutely vital that your pitch is really perfect and bankable and investors feel confident about it. And it's not that much work. You can really get that done in a few days in some personal coachings. We also put hundreds of hours of our content online, of our interviews, of our classes, FAQ, and everything else. So you can really be the best presenter you can be. It's going to be really awesome. So check it out on my website right now. It's hosted on julianulich.c. You can also find all of our entrepreneurship articles and let us know what you still want to know about the process of raising funds. We have gotten 80 questions from you and we have answered every single one of them in our online course. So we hope this is hopeful, helpful and we hope that you're going to ask us more questions and that we're going to get those questions answered on our web portal. Check it out, julianulich.co or obviously exventure.co. But this is enough with the updates from me. Let's get started on our program tonight. Oliver, uh, where are we going to go first? Uh, we're heading to Mike in Berlin, actually, um, joining us to talk about consulting clean tech companies, which is quite synonymous to what we do. So Hello. Excellent. See that. Yes. And there Can he is, is, live in Berlin. Mike, nice to meet you. Uh, hi, nice to meet you, Julian. Yeah. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. <laughs> okay, there you are. The nice moon background. It's not that late Thank in you. Germany. I know it's dark, but not that dark yet, right? Uh, yeah, it's 11. Uh, it's like in the morning. So, Tell us something about yourself. Uh, I got info from Oliver. You're doing consulting for clean tech companies. How did you get into this? Um, yeah, I started my, my career as a mechanical engineer, kind of. And... Uh, 2008, I switched into the management and, uh, and I had my first lean management project. So uh, there was like a, a CEO who, who pushed uh, lean management really hard and lean management is about efficiency. Mm -hmm. So that was the first uh, project I got in contact with, with, uh, with an external consultant. And me, I was between the external consult consulting and my company. And uh, I learned uh, a lot about lean management. I, I really like this business, and I stick to it until until now. And during this time, I, I did my my bachelor degree in value added management. It's uh, yeah, it's it's based on lean lean management methods and efficiency, increase efficiency. And right after, I did my my MBA in entrepreneurship and innovation management because I always dreamed about my my own company. And I finished this uh, this uh, last year, and afterwards I decided to 
to travel for a year for 14 months actually uh, five five months of it the last five in, in bali oh excellent and, where, where uh, did you go <laughs> changu probably just, right sorry where, where did you go changu or seminyak or where did you end up uh it was in total it was 13 countries okay so i start main of it was in in south america mm -hmm. and i got one of the last planes from from the philippines to to Denpasa. And it was in march so it was uh, yeah when corona starts i i stayed until uh, august and uh, beginning of august i returned to germany oh, it's, it's kind yeah. of a magical time still out here I mean, it's really uh, <laughs> yeah. it's been a little bit quiet yeah, i fell but... in love with, with bali right away yeah. i have to say yeah no, no, we could yeah. definitely use some more qualified people on the island sometimes to get stuff done. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm planning. I'm planning to return in February. So. Ah, okay. You're, you're interviewing right now. <laughs> if you're allowed to come re and, and return to Bali, I totally get it. <laughs> like we made the decision to just simply not leave. It was easier. Right? Just, you know, we just said let's just stay here and see what happens. And I think uh, with what's going on in Germany right now, there was a pretty good call. Um, nice. So, but you bring your skill set mainly to the sustainable uh, industries, renewables. Uh, what is your key yeah, focus well, in there? Yeah, when I return, uh, I start right away to to write my business plan here, and I always have uh, I like this field sustainability, and now I create this uh, the service. It's about increasing efficiency based on lean management methods. But I only want to support companies who are have uh, next to to uh, increase uh, like to getting better, like getting more march or, or increase uh, uh, give in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also want to support companies who are want to increase the sustainability as well. So that's for me. Um, yeah, it, it's a it's a it's a base basis to to start with it. And, yeah. and what is like the perfect size company uh, that you like to get involved in? I mean, this is probably not something for very early startups. This is something when uh, uh, your life gets more and more inefficient on a daily basis, the bigger you get. Not that I've ever experienced that, but it does happen. Yeah, you, uh, it works good if you have like repetitive uh, processes. So then, then this, this lean management works. But uh, focusing now on manufacturing industry, just because I have uh, the ma most experience in it. Mm -hmm. So let's say a middle, 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 middle-sized companies, but they produce something. So something manufacturing or producing something. I mean, the last three years I worked in in the marketing uh, department. So I'm also used to administration processes that work together. But yeah, I'm, I'm focusing on manufacturing industry yeah. and is that uh, mainly for German customers or what's your focus um, I mean I got my first customer for January so uh, it's uh, I start with him and I need to I mean I'm good ex experience in, in lean management methods but for sustainability I need to I need to uh, get more practice and build up like a, uh, a blueprint or templates how to how to work and how on which part to focus on yeah so for my first project i mean after after this this one in january i plan to return to 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 bali and I, i'm not sure i told you about my friend michael he he opened a marketing company in 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 bali and which we one are is planning it? to 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 make like a package out of it yeah. so marketing which company and efficiency is it? Do, consulting do we know? Is this Jime bring it or together. whatever it's called? Huh? Bring it together. Ah, okay. This, this to topics, yeah. yeah. Uh, this, the, it's, you know, we're such a small community now. I mean, we would literally think that like we all know each other, and know what we're doing, right? It's like a very no, uh, small little, sorry. super <laughs> cool village. <laughs> yeah, he, he told me about you, and that, that's okay. how I found you. So Yeah, I'm also terrible with names. That, that might be it. Um, how, what is your experience, or is it too early to tell how these customers react to working with them online? Um, I know especially sustainability manufacturing, very, very change resistant usually. And if mm -hmm. you don't sit with them like literally at the coffee table, it's, it's tough to get through to them. Any experience that yet? Yeah, I think that I, I, at the beginning I need, I need close contact. That's for the first months of, of a project like this. You ne I need to, to have a personal contact. I mean, it's like a three-step three, three step, 
I'm, I'm thinking about to, how to work. So first of all, it's increasing, uh, it's it build up a, a picture or make an analysis, analysis how the process works, works actually. So I, I want to create a picture how it is today. And in Lean Management, you have a, a lot of tools for it, like a value, value stream mapping. Mm -hmm. And I, I will build it up with, with more like, uh, ideas I have. But uh, the main part is to create a picture from the process. And the, the, let's say the CEO of the company has to agree that that's a process, actually. Because sometimes what people have in mind and how it is, it's different. Yeah. So after it, I would like to create a, a goal picture, how the, the process should be in the future. And the third step, then, then that's when the coaching starts. It's like, OK, now, now we want to reach the goal. And uh, in, in the past, I worked a lot with shop floor management. So it's like building up, a, um, let's say, a, a whiteboard or a, a tool where you, where you bring all up the, the KPIs, the information you need to, to lead the team. And that's when the coaching starts. And we uh, put it together with, uh, with improvement projects like uh, how, how uh, is it uh, how can we how can we make sure that the people from who are working in this process if they have ideas to to improve it how can we make sure that the ideas get in like kind of a system so we need to build up a system what uh, what make sure the ideas can uh, getting uh, yeah we, we to to check the ideas and bring something out of it so yeah and i think that the one key goal to it is that to do it as soon as possible uh in my experience of, of building a rather large company the later it is the tougher it gets to implement any kind of structures or work process if they're not there from the get-go and the service is not there the software is not there uh to do it later when it becomes too complex and people have gotten used to a way of of doing something very very difficult to get to change people's behaviors. I mean, it's easy to buy yeah. a new software. I always get super exactly. excited about this like new wonder app that's like going to finally bring order into chaos. But if nobody uses it, obviously, it it's becomes you know pretty useless investment pretty quickly. That, that's that's so true. Uh, and the, I, I worked in this field for the past ten years, and it, it, it's uh, the main part of the work was to to convince the people to to work with these ideas. For example, if the management say, okay, lean management, that, that's the way how we want to improve, how we want to get better, to get more efficient. And let's say over 50% of the work was to, to talk about it, like why we do it, is it good to do it? And I, what I think is if you bring together this both topic, sustainability and efficiency, that it's more like a walk into open doors because if a CEO of a company want to work with me and not only want to, to be better, be more efficient, he also want to uh, increase uh, sustainability, then it's much more easy to change, in my opinion. Yeah. Because if it's, uh, if it's just people... profit driven, I, I, I'm with you on that. If it's just profit driven and efficiency for efficiency's sake, uh, which ultimately exactly. can also mean, you know, you got to let people go, you're not going to get a lot of support. Right. If it's if it's for a bigger goal, whatever, stopping climate change or you know reducing waste, it's easier to get people motivated. And especially like places like like Germany, where people are very conscious of these issues. Yeah, exactly. Right now in Germany, it's kind of uh, trendy this topic. I have to say, it's uh, it's like yeah, a lot of uh, companies, let's say, jump on the train and want to want to do something in this area. And I think it's a good time for it to bring this. This together, and I, I believe also that um, often it's like okay, we are sustainability, we are sustainable, so the price have to be more higher somehow. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe that. I think it's it don't don't uh, sustainability don't need to be expensive. I think it's actually the opposite. It's a it less, fits less good wasting together. resources. Everything should be cheaper at the end of the day, right? If you do it right. Yeah. Right. It's win-win, I think. Yeah. yeah, it's win-win, and it's much more easy to convince people that it's the right path or the right way to how to work and yeah. change Excellent. are more easy. I hope. If, if do you have still any free capacities, or you're going to be totally booked out with this one customer in, in January? Um, 
No, I'm I'm looking I'm looking uh, that right now I'm doing uh, to build up like a, a network and uh, and work on marketing how I want to um, yeah find customers at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to to swing by when I when I return to Bali. Absolutely, I said we really have a great network here, very very interdisciplinary, a lot of cool people, a lot of people in sustainability. I think we really kind of created a little hub here, and it's growing on a daily basis. If uh, somebody wants to get in contact with you and work with you, what's the best way to reach out to you? What, what's your website or your LinkedIn? What's the best way to work with you? Yeah, I just opened it. It's, uh, Mike Mike Mars dot de. That's why the Mars is in the background. Mm -hmm. Uh, I get it. I get it. It took me only 25 Mars, minutes yeah. and I still don't get it. Thanks for pointing Actually, it out. The, yes. This name name was created in in, uh, in Bali. Yeah. So we we lived together with a uh, we all met in hostel and we lived together with with a uh, bunch of people. Yeah. And one of our friend we we call her Moon, like the moon. And I don't know, we was we talked about planets and stuff yeah. and Somehow, Mike Mars. My name is Mike, so yeah. Mike Mars, and I liked it, and I stick to it. It's, it's cool. Yeah. So it's it's, it's uh, the website is now very Mike catchy. Mars. If it doesn't work out, you can still become a pop star, or <laughs> you know, change careers with that name. They got so many opportunities with that. And it doesn't <laughs> sound like scary German, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I ho I hope first in in the sustainable field, but yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, At awesome. least uh, maybe something else. So it's Mike Mars de. And uh, what's your estimated time frame? When are you going to be back here? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm planning in February. So okay, I will do cool. this first job in January. And I figure out now the uh, visa situation. You need a sponsor and, uh, in Indonesia. It, it all But, can uh, be done. Yeah. It all can I be done. I think at the beginning of February. Excellent. Well, we're going to sit down when you're back here. Good luck uh, on that customer. I'm sh quite sure there's a lot you can learn from that already, implement it, and then grow it from here. And so that's all we'll be doing here. We're all building platforms. Right? We put a lot of knowledge online these days. We transfer a lot of, you know, this kind of made up things into processes that can be replicated. So I think it's a great time yes. to do that. Mike, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate Julius, it. Thank you for having See me. See you in Bali. Thank you so much. Right? Greetings. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Cool. Um, Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of way to work together on this thing. As also with EX Academy, we're you know working on putting a lot of process information online to make you the best entrepreneur you can be. And again, putting these processes in place at an early stage is really the key because once you have like 100 people working on it, any kind of change becomes very, very difficult and a lot of people simply not go with it. So um, it, it does make it a lot uh, more difficult to implement change later on. Um, Oliver, what's going on next? I see you like waving and... Uh, we just, uh, it was an interesting discussion. Quite interesting to see that he had a base around Bali uh, and is transitioning back um, within the state sustainability sector. But we're heading back to Berlin again uh, with Philip, who unfortunately couldn't join us last week due to uh, a time difference miscalculation. Um, so uh, that's back into the fintech sector, really looking at how technology is taking over financing sustainability and across the board. And fingers crossed, uh, he will be able to join us via Zoom this time uh, yeah, cool. for, for the interview. Um, yeah, let's let's give this a try. I mean, fintech, uh, we're expanding a little bit um, out of our clean tech niche. Um, Partially also because after like 180 episodes, we feel a little bit that we have seen a lot of companies already out there in this field and uh, we want to stay uh, exciting. So we're you know, inviting more companies out of the fields of robotics, AI, fintech to come on our program and share with what they're doing. There's so much innovation going on, so many different disciplines. And um, I just love to be here and just hear from you what you come up with. So if you want to pitch for us, please reach out to us especially for February 16th. I think we're going to have about two, 3,000 uh, visitors for that for a EX Cleantech Venture Night. And it's not just going to be Cleantech anymore. It's called it now Tech Venture Night. So if you've got some cool technology, some great idea, and think we should feature you to our investor network, please reach out to us now so we can still figure out, get you on the program. Um, let's try this out, right? I see something popping up here. Philip is on. Philip, can you hear me? Classic Zoom opening question. Should be able to. 
I should be able to hear us. I don't hear you yet. It all looks good. I see a picture there with a the gray sky in the back. There we are. Philip, how are you? I don't have your audio yet. I can see you pretty well, actually very well, but no audio. This looks so gray in German in the background. This is uh, not me. He doesn't have an audio connection yet. He needs to select a mic. You could just ask that. Um, Oliver, over to you for some tech support here. See what's going on. Uh, so he will only hear you. Okay. So you need to ask him to select a microphone. Uh, can you select? He's done that now. He's done that now. Should work. Ah, well. now we hear you. <laughs> Welcome. Good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. Yeah, it's actually good morning in, in Germany. Yes. So, <laughs> but where, good afternoon to you. Where are you? It looks so familiar in your background somewhere. In the windows look look German and it looks so gray outside. Yeah. Uh, right here. It's, uh, yes. Next to the other in, in, in Hamburg. Hamburg, okay. Yeah, Hamburg. Old home. Wo bist du in Hamburg? Um, in uh, Uhlenhorst. This is okay. unser Büro. Yeah, cool. Cool, cool, cool. But it's, it's getting cold in Germany, right? I'm just taking a wild guess. Yeah. It is. It is pretty cold now. Minus one degree, I think, actually, today. Ugh. Oh. As an old northern German, you know, I can't, just can't handle it. Just thinking about it, I get backache and I feel feel down. It's just, uh, <laughs> life's pretty good in Bali. I, I'm not sure if I could handle another northern German winter. It's been a while. <laughs> Excellent. So, Philip, let's yeah. dive into it. What do you do with your company? Yeah, with, with Neofin, uh, Neofin Hamburg GmbH, we help um, companies in Germany which have a focus on sustainability to um, issue security tokens, basically. And we are like a full service company. Um, we help them with designing the financial product. We help them to, to spread the world about, about the mission, about the vision. And uh, we actually earn corporations with the Pogemann Reederei. Um, it's, a, it's a shipping brokerage company, the renowned ones in, in the most renowned shipping brokerage company from, from Germany, actually, mm -hmm. in the handy size sparker market. And uh, their office is right next to ours, so a good fit. And they are in business since 1886, 68, something like this. And um, yeah, pretty traditional company is now exploring the world of blockchain and security tokens and we're happy to happy to help them of course yeah. and um yeah looking forward to expand this this mission for from our side to have more companies uh joining this revolution or financial revolution with security tokens and um you know, exploring this this opportunity together with us uh, give us for, for the people that that don't really have a you know blockchain background something like that uh, can you give us a quick introduction? What is a security token and why should I use one? Okay, sure. So a security token is basically a representative or representation of a classical security, but with the, due to the blockchain technology, you can streamline processes much more efficiently and um, offer everyone the opportunity in, to invest into these products. And for instance, with Pokemon, we, we said, hey, we can accept investments from a thousand dollars onwards uh, but in theoretically you could also offer investments from let's say ten dollars onwards one dollar maybe even if you um, have an effective online bank and stuff like this and the process is out full automatically um, but yeah in our case we can offer investments from a thousand dollars onwards and if I, as an investor, would, would uh, like to invest into the green dolphins, which are the most environment-friendly, the most efficient bar carriers of the world, which are recently designed by, by Fogelmann, uh, then I can. I can invest with these, with, uh, from $1,000 onwards. I'll hold my security tokens in my, in my wallet, also in your like, digitized uh, uh, wallet on, on the blockchain. And uh, in exchange for these, for your thousand dollars, you receive an interest rate uh, based on the amount of tokens you hold, uh, which is a fixed interest rate of eight percent per year, and uh, plus um, opportunity of a profit sharing together with Pokemon. And yeah, that will be 
paid out on your annual basis, not to your wallet, but to the bank account you invested in or invested from. And um, yeah, we are happy to discuss this, this matter with everyone who, who is interested in, in doing so and exploring the opportunity to invest in, yeah, to, to, to lower the uh, carbon emissions on our oceans. And uh, it's, a, it's a great thing. And uh, yeah, we are we're supporting Pokemon on, on their mission for green shipping. I mean, then there's, I mean, shipping is, is so far behind on the environmental scale. I mean, it's, it's really, I haven't seen much disruption, at least in the last 30 years, but maybe something is coming soon. Um, how does Baffin feel about this? I mean, obviously, you're talking to non-accredited investors. Uh, you need to go through the general prospectus process? Or? Yes, we do. The mm -hmm. full prospectus uh, process. Um, we were first, um, of, we went first, first to the authority in, in Liechtenstein, to the FMR just a quicker way of doing it. So you get your first approval there. Then you go over to the BAFA and say, hey, I have this approved prospectus from a uh, state from the EU. And then by EU passporting, there's a process called, you can go to the BAFA, to, you can go to Switzerland, you can go to Austria, and then get a quick check on, on your already approved prospectus to, yeah, to have this also to be, be, be approved by, by the local authority. For instance, for us, it's, it's a BAFA. Yeah, because I mean, for us, always the the biggest challenge not was so much the the exchange of shares or the signing of contracts, is the absolute limitations on 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 general solicitation. Right, you can't really tell anybody that you're raising money, otherwise you're very very quickly in in uh, in, in trouble with with Baffin and and any other regulatory authority pretty much in the world. Um, but so you're offering your financial products right now only in the in Europe, or you're also getting approval in, in the U.S. markets, for example? No, the U.S. is excluded from, from the offering. Same goes with China and uh, Iran. But for the rest of the world, it's pretty much straightforward. Uh, visit our, not the Neofin website, but the greenshiptoken.com mm -hmm. site, from, which is from Pokemon, and then you're, you're good to go. How do how do customers and investors react to it? I mean, I I did a you know a you know a blockchain offering two years ago, um, but like the investors we work in sustainability are, are usually you know a little bit older, uh, very conservative, especially this kind of financial products you're talking about with the fixed interest rates. I mean, they're usually not the most uh, most techie guys out there. How how do these people that usually might otherwise invest into container fleets or something like that, how do they react to a, to a fully digital offering? Do, do they get it or do they put it all into one pot with, with the Bitcoin or whatever, Ethereum or whatever else they might have heard about from the press? Okay, yeah. Well, our approach is, uh, first of all, these are not, not container, container ships, but just uh, you would throw in uh, raw materials like steel, coal, mm -hmm. something you need all around the world at all time. So even during the Corona crisis, we didn't see a like a, a deep. We didn't see any problems with these ships. They had uh, had to do business. Yeah, like steel. Steel is always used. Coal is always used or food. So that wasn't a problem. Uh, with con container ship, that was a different story. And um, when we are approaching investors, of course, um, most of the people are still new to blockchain technology and security tokens. So um, we have to, to, to introduce them to, to the, this new concept. But um, outside of Germany, let's say Austria, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, it's, they are more familiar with the concept already. And um, even with institutional investors, it's much easier to approach them than, for mm -hmm. instance, here in Germany. Maybe that's because of the BaFin and their really strict rules, And uh, but we have also seen technical problems, for instance, with banks that so say, hey, we can't have um, our investment leave our own ecosystem, so we need to uh, first implement a solution for us to hold our security tokens on our own wallet before we can invest into, in, into your product, for example. And yeah, we, we are in development of such solutions to, to help banks and institutional investors to do so. At the moment, we are using a, a BaFin licensed uh, custody provider for digital securities. Um, that is enough for, for most of our investors, but for huge institutional investors or big institutional investors, they, they have yeah, compliance rules, which are not um, 
which uh, do, do which cause some problems for for yeah. holding or investing to, to into security tokens. It's it's actually kind of bizarre that it's it's you know it has been so complex for large financial institutions to just kind of even hold these tokens because like if you're trading shares between Germany and and the U.S. Um, you know, if you if you're selling Lufthansa shares in the U.S., you're actually not buying shares, right? You you're buying depository receipts, which ultimately is almost like the same thing. I mean, a security token, if it's well structured and has the right prospectus behind everything else, is is almost nothing else than a depository receipt. So I don't know why it's it's so much diff more difficult to do that digitally than if you do an offering between two cross countries and you're not trading to shares. But uh, as I said, it's a very slow moving industry. Uh, in general, how do you feel in Germany? Is there the adoption of, of blockchain technology picking up? Yes, definitely. Of blockchain technology in general, um, of course, I'm part of a nonprofit association which is called Beerchain, uh, where we connect all players from blockchain in, in Berlin. And um, we see a huge influx and in interest from the general community, but also from companies like Telekom, etc., to, to be part of this movement. And um, now specialized in security tokens. Um, I, I'm, of course, in contact with banks and uh, financial service providers here from, from inside of Germany on a daily basis. And they tell me, hey, we have plans. We're not ready yet, but we have plans for Q2, Q3, 21 to, for instance, um, build up an exchange for, for security tokens and uh, yeah, provide liquidity to this market. Because as you might know, uh, one of the big plus points or advantages of security tokens is that in theory, you could make illiquid assets liquid. But without a secondary market, it's yeah. not the case, right? So this is a problem which needs to be solved. And perhaps not by a startup, but by a traditional exchange which has a common or a big user base already and can then provide this, this service and yeah, start with a good liquid uh, which, which secondary would be the, market. The same we, in will, shares. we will definitely see this yeah. in the coming month. Yeah, I mean, if, if this, the same is, is, you know, with shares, right? If you don't have any market makers in the middle that provide that liquidity, uh, it doesn't really matter what the product is. Um, it's, it's just nobody in the middle that, that guarantees to buy it at the current trading price. Uh, you know, you, you can't have trading of financial securities. It just makes no sense. So um, I'm, I'm glad to see, and I'm really going to wonder who's going to be the first one that might actually be able to do that, because you re have real underlying uh, assets, right? And I think that's that's the big difference um, to many other projects that we see that are really trying to be you know, more like a utility token or more like a direct currency replacement, uh, where it's always a little bit questionable what's what's behind it. But you guys have a real contract with it that's kind of tied to a specific project, and and it's just a digitally traded security like you would usually do a paper contract, right? Exactly, yeah. It's a digitized profit participation, right? And um, the, the prospectus defines what is uh, what is the investment product or for what is the, the raised capital has to be used. And it says it has to be used for eco-friendly or highly efficient um, bulk carriers in the handy size segment. So yeah, that's, that's our underlying asset. And we're really proud of it. Like this is the one of a kind um, boat. It's a state of the art art ship, I'd call it. And uh, yeah, we have German technology in it. From, from so what what uh, does what, what makes it uh, different, and what does it make it more efficient from from a technical perspective? Uh, it's it's first of all the the newest or latest model of uh -huh. the the German engines, which are built into these uh, ships. And then it's a design, the design of the, of the ship, uh, which is uh, constructed by, by Fogemon themselves. And this really makes a huge difference. So we would use the, the, the Fogemon Green Dolphins consume nine tons of fuel less every day they are in business. Okay. So uh, with the fuel cost of, let's say, today, um, about $300 per ton of fuel, um, depending on where you buy it now, um, you save around three thousand dollars each day by running okay. these these eco-friendly ships. Very cool. We'd love to have a look at it. If you could like drop us a presentation, maybe Oliver already has one. I just haven't seen it yet. But yeah, if you could sure. drop us some pictures and some info, that would be great. Um, if I want to have my own security token in Europe, what's the best way to reach out to you? 
Well, you will visit neofin minus uh, hamburg.de uh, and then visit the English um, version and just call us. Just call us. Just uh, look at the number and uh, call me. Very cool. Uh, just a rough, rough, rough idea. How much does it cost these days to, to issue a security token, including prospectus? Just rough ballpark. Yeah. Uh, with the prospectus, of course, the legal costs are the, the big amount, like the highest amount of, of the cost. Uh, doing the smart contract isn't isn't as uh, difficult anymore as it used to be. And then it really depends on the amount you would like to raise. If it's below seven million, uh, then it might be with with legal costs and everything about forty thousand, maybe forty thousand US dollars to have everything done with EU passporting, uh, pr ready-made prospectus, etc. Um, if you you would like to issue more than seven, an investment product with a uh, volume with more than seven million uh, euros, and it's uh, maybe yeah, it's getting more expensive then. Yeah, I'm just we used to pay I think just for the for the passport, uh, just for the prospectus in Germany about fifty thousand just the legal fees, and then comes the passporting, and then comes you know the other legal advice and the auditing and the all the stuff that kind of goes into it. Um, it's it's not a cheap hobby, but Ultimately, and for anybody that's out here, don't offer your shares for sale without a prospectus to a broad market. It really can come back to hurt you. Um, it's almost never legal. I think we can sum this thing up. If you want to offer your shares or your tokens or whatever you're offering, if it's a financial product to a broad audience of non-accredited investors, you're probably breaking the law and one or the other financial authority will come after you. Probably not on day one, but the latest when you're really successful. And that really, really hurts. <laughs> Right. Thank you, Philip, so yeah. much for one, your time. One last gonna, question. Yeah, one question one from question. Oliver, who's extra analyst on the team here. So you're going to have to read it to him because he doesn't okay. have a mic to me. But in terms of the green mandate that you're focusing on, um, where does the fact that you're shipping coal across the world come into play as a shipping company? So you're you're greenifying the shipment process, but do you do you greenify the coal shipments that happen as well? In the fact that that's a good that's being transported. Or do you only work in other materials that are being shipped? Philip, were you able to hear that? A uh, question mm -hmm. is about uh, your, your green mandate uh, that you have to be as green as possible. But obviously, you're shipping a lot of coal around. Um, so your key focus is just on the shipping part or also in going further of maybe reducing the amount of coal that's shipped and what comes after? No. No, you see, the Pokemon is a shipping brokerage company, so they rent out the ships on the daily basis. Uh, we are not we are not choosing which um, products they actually put in there, but yeah. um, or which products or raw materials are transported with the Green Dolphins. Yeah, so that's that's out of our hands. Yeah, no, it's a bro. It's, it's a Shipping brokerage in northern Germany is a big, old, very, very, very uh, established art form. Uh, many of my family members were in that, and friends is something I've been done doing for hundreds of years. So we wish you all the good luck with that, and we'd love to see a little bit more about the design of that ship, mm -hmm. because obviously a lot of big shipping companies out here in Asia is, as well that might be you know interested in working with you guys out there. And we get back to you if you want to offer a security token in Germany, or if somebody else wants to do that. Philip, thank you so much for the great information. Have a great day. Bye-bye to my, my home. Bye. Right? Stay warm. <laughs> <laughs> you too. Winter's just starting. Bye-bye. Uh, super interesting. Um, I really would love to see more about that, that ship because uh, shipping in itself is just such an inefficient process. And it is just so polluting and so much sulfur in the air and particles and everything. It's just so, so messy. So uh, I really hope there are going to be some technical breakthroughs. Uh, Oliver, I want to have that one company from Norway on the program that does the, the sales again. I, I, I send you the link. Uh, we talked about it recently. One but, company uh, from Norway that does sales. Yeah, Great they were like all over the news like a few weeks ago. And, and okay. I want that artificial milk company still from Singapore. I mean, if I can make requests. True. Always, uh, always requesting. Jason. Exactly, always requests. Uh, but we try to make this interesting. Uh, cool, Oliver, what's next? Uh, we have Slav here in, in the studio that's about to showcase some paralysis technology, I believe. Fantastic. Welcome. I mean, we always love on-site guests. That's actually my favorite. Uh, we love to be online, but in person is always better. Slav, come join us. Good to see you, my friend. How are you? Uh, good to see you. I'm good, thank you. Uh, you need to take the mic. Keep it, keep it very directional. 
So if you don't speak right into it, you are all dressed up. Yeah, it's good well, because I, I do it too. So you, you were up I know it's it's very rare for us that we even really wear pants here. It's a almost long pants-free environment. Uh, we are mainly in shorts and flip-flops. So yeah. some of the f my friends here I don't even recognize once they put some real clothes on. Um, <laughs> Slav, tell us something about yourself. What brought you to Bali? Uh, uh, actually, I've been traveling around the world together with my wife, and the ratio of how much does it cost and the quality of life you're getting. This is the ratio that brought me here. So, you know, it's quite good in US, in Europe, partly in Russia, in Singapore, other Asian countries, Japan. But here, the money you pay and the quality you're getting, the ratio is the best. All organic, I, all I, good. I totally agree, but that doesn't mean you all should come to Bali, please. Right? It's already pretty full here. So we're getting very selective about the people that we let in. We, we're really not, but I'm just saying that. So otherwise, they all show up on our beach. Um, you got a quite interesting background. You've been on the road for a long time. Yes, I am. Uh, I actually uh, have financial mathematician and MBA backgrounds. And uh, the project that I'm going to talk about is the project that I'm working on for seven years. So mostly trying to partner with Southeast Asia. And, but we also did some attempts in uh, Europe and the United States and Southern America, Brazil. So. Uh, can I can I start uh, telling about that? Absolutely. One? Tell us about it's, it's kind of like my home technology. We're going to be talking pyrolysis a little bit as a summing it up, kind of to give people that means that you don't have enough oxygen for a full combustion using carbonaceous fuels and turn them into gas, solid or liquid, whichever way you you know kind of drive the process. And then you're going to be talking about byproducts. Right? Uh, yeah, I'm going to, uh, to be talking about byproducts. So my company is called Environmental Eco Management, and we invented a new sustainable way to produce silica, carbon, gas, and electricity from rice husk, from rice leftovers, what they actually burn here in the fields all around Indonesia, uh, in India, and in all uh, rice-producing countries. So what we basically do, we produce silica and carbon together. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, we can. This is the Felix. Do we have like our lead camera over here? Yeah. This is uh, the white stuff. Is the silica and the yeah, rest, uh, the yes. black uh, is the red yes. carbon. Too right? close, Julian. Huh? A little bit too close. Yeah. Ah, that's true. There you go. It's such an amazing there camera, that amazing autofocus. It can do anything we want. But uh, you see it here, it's white stuff, silica, black stuff, it's the carbon. Just taking a look at it. Uh, yeah, and after that, we are dividing that into two, uh, these two parts. Mm -hmm. If you can see, this white one is 100, almost 100% 100 pure silica, 99.99. Mm -hmm. .99, and this is 100% pure carbon. Mm -hmm. So what we're actually doing, sorry, I'll put that down. Uh, so what uh, we are actually doing is we are taking uh, agricultural waste because mm -hmm. uh, it's a big problem of utilization of rice husk and you know in the developing Asian countries people just burn the fields and there is a huge amount of CO2 and huge amount of carbon emissions going to the and, air. And the particles. I mean it's, it smells up. If you have never experienced it, we had just had it last week. Um, you know it smokes up your entire villa and we kind of know what's in the emission. It's not good. Like wet rice husks just doesn't burn well. It actually just smolders. And part of that is because of the silica that's in there. Uh, yeah actually uh, it's a huge problem with burning that and you know when the agriculture is not that well developed in developing countries people just burn the fields because they this is the cheapest way to utilize that and after that they can plant rice again and then do it again and repeat it again and again. Uh, actually, uh, we are taking all the carbon out, so there, uh, we reduce carbon emissions by 97%, so there is almost no carbon emissions going to the air. So we take all the expensive stuff from rice husk and rice leftovers, so uh, carbon, which is really expensive, and silica, uh, the d uh, demand for which is just growing during the last five d uh, years, and it's going to grow extremely because like, now I have three phones, so there is the TV, all the, uh, you know, like all the computer stuff is made with the help of silica. Also a lot of cosmetics and paintings, coating, tires. So there is huge market for that nowadays. Um, is the production cost competitive to mining in that sense? 
Uh, actually, uh, our margin, is, uh, so we are 40% uh, more effective than existing uh, producers that uh, from mining and from uh, producing uh, silica from sand. Because first of all, we invented some new physical processes which uh, consume less electricity. So uh, the production is less expensive. And at the same time, we are getting gas and silicon and carbon during the same process. Mm -hmm. So actually, we are 40% more competitive. And for future, you know, scaling up this technology can bring uh, huge profit for investors who might be interested. So yeah. I, I think you're asking uh, in terms of investment because I know that there are many technologies that are not profitable, but this one, really, we did a lot of calculations. We are 40% more profitable than the competitors nowadays. Yeah. And uh, where do you stand? I know you talked about you building your industrial final prototype or is it already industrial unit in, in Russia right now? Uh, so actually talking about our company roadmap, we started with uh, development together with Moscow State University. So we set it up a small uh, just a proof of concept to see that it works. Then we did some uh, development uh, in Vietnam. And nowadays uh, what we are doing, we already s built an industrial prototype so the proof of concept in the industrial scale. And right now, uh, our engineers are working on that in Krasnodar region in southern part of Russia. So we brought all the details of the materials to one place. And now they are assembling that. Hopefully in like 13 days, it's going to be ready. And then you are welcome to come and to see that it really works. Because this, this moment really for me uh, is an exciting one because we've spent a lot of time invested uh, a lot of money ourselves, you know, sleepless nights, talking with different people, negotiations, negotiations. And now we are at the point when we are ready to present our uh, in industrial proof of concept. It's, it's definitely the ex exciting moment because uh, as we know, it's, it's in this early phase when you're coming up with the technology, you do your proof of concept. It's very, very difficult to find investors that are willing to go this road with you and invest into this company at this early stage. Once you have proven the concept and it's about growth, it gets gets a lot, lot easier because there's very little venture capital in the industry. Uh, we spent a big chunk of that already, so we're partially to blame. And um, But there's a lot of money in the project development, right? It's yeah, actually, you know, uh, when we first started development of that, like seven years ago, we were thinking about maybe one, two, three million rubles. Just like, you know, like uh, those, uh, that times it was like 50, 60, 70,000 US dollars. But, you know, like next development, we need to build this one. We need to fly to Cambodia to get samples of husk. We need to f see the supply chain. We need to uh, do a lot of analysis. So actually this sum just flew to the sky. But actually I'm very happy that we financed all that uh, by our own money. Because we got, you know, like on some early stages, you can get an investor who will get like 80% of a stack. Okay. And then you'll just have a, a, a little thing. So but You still have all the risk and all yes. the work. Yeah, it's, yeah. You have all the downside. Uh, yeah, <laughs> all, all the downside. But on the other hand, all the yeah. future profits. So, yeah. you know, it's much better to get money on the stage when you have a proof of concept. Exactly. exactly. Rather it's than like, like, oh, I have an idea. And then investor, okay, 95% to me, and you'll just stay for 5%. Exactly. That's, that's what I meant. It's, it's, uh, if, if you do the early deal, you're just staying on to do all the work, take on all the risk, and if you're actually successful, it's already gone. And as I said, we, we were also behind. We did our first uh, raise in 2006, and we thought that we are going to make it with a few million. It's turned into so many millions at this point to just, as you said, always building something else, building next phase prototype, and and uh, doing more complex technologies. But obviously rice husk is a massive industry out there. Um, it's also a massive polluter if you look at India, if you look at China, if you look at you know Southeast Asia overall, a lot of the air pollution that we have is not industrial. There's like a big misconception, it's, it's crop burning. And, and silica is really, um, as in it's, it's, it's great to have as a sellable commodity. And we need to do something about it because this feeling that we can constantly get smoked up, it's like, you know, it was like 200 years ago. Um, are you raising funds in the next phase? 
And how much? Uh, so actually, I, I'll tell you more about uh, business modeling. Uh, just a few words. So for now, we already have signed contracts with six companies. We gave them samples, and they said that they are ready to buy all the products that we are producing because of our high quality, mm -hmm. and of course of cheaper price that they can get in the market. So uh, at the moment now, what we are doing, we are looking for a strategic partner. Uh, with whom we can uh, set up a big industrial factory and then start scaling all around Southeast Asia because we are not focusing on one factory. It's not interesting for us. Yeah. So we want to change the whole industry. First, help in rural areas like Cambodia. I talked to Cambodia government. They need electricity and they have got tons of rice husk like uh, really uh, uh, millions of tons. So we can be helping uh, countries uh, doing it in a sustainable way. And we are actually looking for a smart environmental friendly partner. You know, like nowadays there are environmental investors in sustainability, in someone who understands future value of what we are doing. Yeah. And so, you know, we would be same minded. So it's not going to be only to talk about money, money, money and profit. So it's going to be about doing sustain it in a sustainable way and helping people investing yeah. back. But uh, what kind of ballpark are we talking about? And are you going to be building those factories yourself and operating them or you're selling the factories to other operators? Uh, actually, uh, we are not going to sell machinery, so we are looking for someone to partner us with money. So mm -hmm. we're going to be making uh, like country managers and then send, uh, send in our machinery to there. Because actually it's kind of complicated and we need to keep our staff working to, to keep an eye on that. Because, you know, if you change just like half degree, uh, yeah, everything stops and the process yeah. stops stops working. So in this scale, we were thinking about finding a partner, uh, investing money, and we would be uh, building machinery together. Yeah. I already had some talks in Japan. I've been in Tokyo and then in Okinawa, uh, discussing with them that we can be producing the machinery in uh, Japan or, for yeah. example, in China to scale it to scale it fast. Yeah. So we are focusing on capturing big size of the market yeah very very interesting um but for the for the next round what are you kind of looking for amount uh, what we help you right now uh it's 3.2 so 3.2 million us dollars to bring the uh, machinery to like for example if we are talking about java island mm -hmm. so somewhere close to Jog jakarta i already saw some talk to government and see the place where we can bring it so we need money to ship machinery mm -hmm. and then we need money to set up a laboratory to make the uh, dividing stage into pure silica and pure carbon yeah. and then money for marketing signing up with big companies like evonik biopharma here in bandung on java island so uh, yeah, it's all discussable, you know, like it, uh, I, when I pitch, I always say it depends on the country. Yeah. So if we are talking about United States or Germany, when you need to pay uh, like big taxes, you know, yeah. and uh, the minimum salary is like $17 per hour, and then you need to hire like 25 people. So the, the this amount the goes up. very, very yeah. different. Yeah. Yes, the cost is very yeah. different. Talking about, so 3.2 million is uh, like to set up the factory from the ground. Like mm -hmm. we and we don't have any connections to water, to electricity, no people, like from nothing. Yeah. So um, I do actually have discounted cash flow calculations with, you know, big four, big three standards calculated. Mm -hmm. So uh, if somebody would be interested, I can share that. Yeah. So I think that would be the correct uh, answer. So I'm yeah. ready to share uh, CapEx uh, yeah. and like all this uh, DCF calculations to but people but you need you need money to to build the next factory to start producing and and not so much to grow the company it, it's less of an equity investment it's more of a project investment right yeah it's more about project uh, investment nowadays so just I need to bring the machinery that I already produced and yeah. then to set up a lab to do the next stage uh, yeah. for uh, dividing the products and then we can go to next round of financing you know just for scaling. Yeah. When, when we'll have the operating factory and people can see that everything works. But we, uh, I think on that stage, we already can talk to Biopharma or Evonico, companies who would be willing to buy our products because yeah. we'll give them a yeah. uh, cheaper price so they can, can so be... So you, you secure the input, you secure the output, and then you finance the conversion. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, kind of cool. that. What, what's the best way to reach you? 
Uh, actually, uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn. My last name is Kasatkin, K-A-S-A-T-K-I-N. Mm -hmm. uh, like Instagram also starts with Kasatkin, my WhatsApp. I'll and you also you're going to stay in, in, in Bali for a little bit, right? So yeah, maybe the I easiest way to reach him is, is reach out to us. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I would be happy because... Uh, People can reach up to you and then you just connect yeah. them to me. So, you know, uh, sharing these DCF calculations and you have yeah. all my contacts, my WhatsApp, exactly. my, my local and, number. And what we'd also would love to do, I mean, if we can can get one of our, we still run a gasification lab in, in Germany, which always sounds a bit funny. But um, if we could maybe get somebody over to see the operation in Russia, uh, uh, would be very interesting. After 15th of December, when yeah. uh, my engineers are setting that up, and I would be but sure when, that when it properly works. Exactly. Of course, welcome, There's no welcome. Hurry. Yeah, yeah, we can make, uh, actually already worked on making invitations for Cambodian uh, mm -hmm. partners. Yeah. So we can make invitations from the government, from uh, Moscow State University, from our company. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even in uh, these thought times, I think that... Uh, like networking and connections this is uh, this yeah. is what moves world forward Absolutely. world forward and so i know like everybody in german who does who works in this industry is a small group of people in research there may be 50 of them and i think in all of gasification pyrolysis put together in research maybe 100 ultimately if you like have all the res assistance and everything else but it's a very very small industry we wish you all the luck in the world i could make a massive difference if you want to invest into this man's company everything else reach out to us uh, we're also happy to explain to you a little bit closer of how the whole process works. We have never heard about it before, but we all know that there are massive amounts of rice husk out in this world. The silica is the problem. That makes it really, really difficult to burn. Also, burning rice husk uh, just mainly produces a lot of clinkers and a lot of problems. So I think uh, there's so much smarter things we can do with it. Slav, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you very much. One thing to add, mm -hmm. uh, internal rate of return is 96%. So okay. investors can be getting back their money in a year and a half. Sounds like a great plan. We'll see you tomorrow night. Yes, sure. Right, for dinner and a drink. Thank yes. you, my friend, for coming thank on you. the program. Thank you. And um, yeah, I mean, there's, when this works and if this works, uh, as you said, you got a pretty, you, you take in waste streams that nobody really wants that are creating a problem and you're turning them into a sellable commodity of very high quality uh, could become very, very interesting. And again, the way we're treating rice husk right now is just not the way forward. It's like, it's just not okay to smoke up your neighbors on a daily basis anymore. Uh, Oliver, how's your villa? It's your rice fields as well or? Yeah, it's, it's the the sort of quarterly uh, open burn that's quite interesting, and it's not just rice husk that they mix in there as well, because it's the the actual plastic waste stream that have developed as well. So yeah. it's quite interesting. I'd be keen to understand what the efficiency of the process that we just understood was, but we can look. Yeah, at we can dig into some some technical things um, at a later stage. Uh, Oliver, how are we doing for tonight? Uh, we have Oled joining us from Oslo, I believe, hopefully, oh, uh, in the next couple of minutes. I'll be bringing very him cool. up on Zoom. Going even further north here. And um, yeah, and then again, I'm just going to take this opportunity to just remind you one more time. February 16th, if you're in the US, Canada companies, we are looking for the best of the companies out there right now. Uh, accelerator companies, of course, always welcome. We want to hear from you. And we're going to open it up. It's not just clean technology at this point. If you're doing AI, robotics, uh, even something cool in fintech that relates to us, we want to hear from you. And also check out our new EX Venture Academy we just opened. Um, we have an incredible course online with a lot of footage. I'm just talking, I don't think we up to like 160 videos. You have to watch all of them. They're kind of set up in a way that if you have a question and you know we ask you the questions, we answer them, you pretty much find everything out there and we can teach you how to become a much better presenter and put all the pieces together that investors want to see. You saw in the last presentation, you know, you need your financial modeling done, you need your story to be told right, you need to have your technical documentation in line. It's not that easy. And we see a lot of entrepreneurs that spend years to build incredible products, and then they spend minutes on their final presentation. And so nobody takes it serious, and they're just wasting their time, and they're wasting their money, because they're just not competitive. So I keep repeating the number. I don't know where we're at at 0.6% of all companies get venture funding. Uh, make sure it's you, but be aware that you're in a highly, highly competitive environment. And we see it again and again every week that the there's sometimes a slight discrepancy between companies 
how they feel, how they present, and how it comes over to an investor perspective. But we have made it. Uh, we're over in Oslo. Can you hear me? The Bangor, actually. Excellent. The Bangor, actually, yes. Ola, looks very good. Is this a fake background or is that your wall? No, this is, uh, this is the wall, you know. Uh, the, 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 this, like is, this is real. Views. You know, they, we have done, uh, I don't know, 350 Zoom calls and, and the, the, the background is, is never stops to amaze us. There's so many options. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, the virtual world today and in the times of COVID-19, we have all become digital masters um, uh, in this uh, universe. Yeah, exactly. And, and we really benefit from because we sit in Bali here on the beach. Um, you know, we're like two minutes from the beach. It's, it's really rough, but we get all the great technology presented to us via Zoom and uh, having, a, having a great time doing it. So you're based in, in Norway, right? It's, so it's, it's real winter for you guys already, correct? Uh, it's, um, uh, I'm based in Norway, Stavanger, Norway. Um, I mean, and in the old days, uh, it used to be real winter time, as you say. Uh, right now, it's rainy, cold, a little bit murky, uh, but no sign of snow or ice uh, right. quite yet. So um, times are changing. That, that's, that's definitely, it used to be freezing cold this time of the year. And uh, tell us about what you do. We always get great companies on from Norway, so super excited. Yeah, so um, uh, we are um, a company that has uh, a vision to make Earth green again. And basically what we have specialized in is uh, creating a liquid compound that has the capability of uh, turning sand into fertile soil uh, to help to reduce uh, the water consumption of green ecosystems um, and basically um, enable things like desert farming and combating desertification and the degradation of topsoil. Okay, can you repeat that one more time? So you came up with a liquid, you put on sand, and then stuff grows in the desert, correct? Yeah, so... so um, <laughs> My job uh, is to make it as simple as possible, right? So that, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, um, so basically what we, uh, what we do, um, just to, uh, to touch uh, on uh, the liquid as you, uh, as you bring up. So um, we have invented a liquid that is uh, primarily based on clay, and the reason why we have used clay is because research all over the world uh, shows that clay rich soils, they contain water and uh, nutrients very well. Mm -hmm. The problem is that working clay into the ground is not so easy. I mean, you can just imagine taking a piece of clay and trying to get that into the ground. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing. Uh, you know, even I, when I bake my pizzas on a, on a Saturday night, just getting the flour evenly into the dough can be yeah. somewhat challenging. Um, so what we have done is we have used uh, technology re really from uh, the oil and gas industry of liquefying clay um, uh, and to do that in a purely natural um, uh, uh, way without the use of any chemicals or, or other substances to make this clay as liquid, um, as, as thin as, uh, as water, more or less. Mm -hmm. And then this liquid can be applied on top of the surface. It will percolate into the soil. It will naturally have these small clay particles form bindings with sand particles throughout the soil so that this soil gets a new structure that retains water and nutrients so that whenever you irrigate it uh, for whatever you planted there afterwards, the water will remain within the soil instead of just disappearing through it and evaporating out due to temperatures and heat. That's, that's really, really awesome. And uh, where do you stand with this product? Is, is this like a proven concept now? Are you out selling that product? Um, where do you stand in, in your development phase? So uh, in terms of development, basically, we are in the technology uh, finalization and technology scale of mode. We've been spending um, uh, most of the time up until now on really validating that the liquid itself works. So you can imagine if you, um, um, you know, invest in heavy uh, production equipment before you actually don't even know how the liquid is going to work. That's not going to be a wise decision. So we've spent a lot of time to really understand the impact of this liquid clay in the soil ecosystem uh, over years. Um, so we first did that with our own resources within the team, followed by um, extensive uh, validation by independent third parties, because you want to make sure that you don't have any bias in there um, yeah. and that you have some external parties that can confirm and verify the findings that you have made yourself. Um, so we completed um, uh, the external validation uh, in uh, two really key uh, areas over the last two years. Um, first, for um, 
sort of uh, taking uh, a desert area and turning it green with uh, with grass uh, and grass families. Um, that was completed uh, the first of those years. And then the second year, we moved on to agricultural crops. Um, um, and after having passed validation in these areas um, and sort of confirming the findings that we've done, you know, since the ID was really conceived more than 10 years ago um, and uh, verifying the findings of uh, the team's own um, pilots and, and field trials, etc. We started to um, uh, build higher production capabilities. So Excellent. in uh, March this year, March 20th, we uh, finalized a um, seed funding round. So we raised uh, a small seed funding uh, to move from having validated the liquid to building scaled up uh, machines. And we want to build uh, then mobile units that process the clay and does this uh, process out in the field near to where we are doing the treatment of the land, because that way we don't have to ship huge amounts of liquid around the world. Uh, and we can source uh, uh, you know, all the inputs that we need as locally as possible, uh, and also create value by uh, employing people and creating jobs and opportunities in local communities around the world where we need to treat soil to help them you know, uh, anything from uh, save water to uh, uh, climate impact initiatives to uh, revigorate uh, climate smart, smart agriculture. This is uh, really, really groundbreaking stuff. I'm, I'm, do you have any major partner yet? I mean, are you walking down the street? Are you talking to our friends from Yara, for example? I mean, Norway is not that big of a country. Uh, no, um, so um, we are now, uh, as I said, um, focused on really building uh, these robust um, uh, processing units. Uh, so we are in a technology scale up stage before we start to scale out into the markets. Uh, and um, as we get closer to uh, sort of full scale commercialization, we will uh, definitely engage uh, with partners in many areas. Uh, so um, um, I think uh, you know, we have do you have, heard, uh, do you know Yara International? A Norwegian company. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think uh, Yara very, is, very, is definitely very close a friends great of ours. I mean, of course, we're not passing anything on without you, you, you know, approving it. But the, I'm just telling you that they're doing something um, internally that I can talk about that might be an interesting fit for you. And uh, they would probably do so, love to do something with a Norwegian company. But I, I can't tell you too much about it in, on our program. But I'd maybe take this offline. With, with your permission. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, um, have you talked you to any countries out there that have, you know, massive amounts of deserts that they try to convert? Because uh, I'm, I'm just, this fits very strongly into something, in, into the two things that I'm really fascinated about right now. The one is ocean farming, but obviously that's a different problem. Um, and the second one is, you know, we work a lot of solar industry, we work a lot of, you know, solar developers. The deserts now are becoming the new commodity. Right, because in the desert you can now have electricity for free, at least during daytime, and that is a huge game changer. Because before electricity was super expensive, you know, it was like a dollar, a dollar twenty per kilowatt hour. Now it's like one cent. Um, so I think the value of deserts in the next twenty years is going to absolutely skyrocket, and the deserts probably will become the green gardens of our planet. So this is uh, like the one missing piece of the puzzle. Um, do you honestly think that in in Outdoor farming with your clay and sand solution could be realistic in places like uh, like real deserts. Um, well, we uh, we already see that that is uh, possible. Um, we've done that in the validation initiatives that we've been running in collaboration with uh, ICBA, International Center for Biosaline Agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, outside of Dubai, where we have focused on open field cultivation, uh, just as you say. Um, uh, sort of uh, transforming desert areas into uh, into a green oasis, into farming land, uh, et cetera. And we've tried it even through the summer months. Uh, so uh, the last project we did now from um, uh, March this year uh, until, until August, uh, we did uh, anything from uh, watermelons, pearl millets, uh, zucchinis and stuff like that in the uh, hot summer months uh, in the desert. Uh, uh, simply by uh, applying the, uh, the treatment that we do with the liquid nano clay uh, to make uh, the sand uh, really absorb and hold water and nutrients in an efficient way. And uh, what we also saw there is like, you can just imagine how much this cools the surface temperature yeah. and really the local area. Once you, you green it and you get the ability to hold on to the moisture in the soil, um, which is a, a significant uh, change to that uh, environment that enables uh, 
plants uh, and crops to withstand uh, the summer heat um, in a desert environment. It's, and I yeah. think you're definitely on to, uh, to, to uh, a very good point here when you talk about sort of uh, um, energy um, as well as an important uh, piece of the puzzle. And um, I think right now what we're seeing is kind of um, the perfect storm of, uh, of the right innovations coming together at the right time as well. You like because the one missing piece of the puzzle, to be quite honest, because uh, if you look, watch our program tomorrow, uh, like out of Israel, you're going to see a lot of amazing AI backed robotics and farming that is coming up, right? We know that we have gotten really, really good of, of, of uh, you know, needing less and less water to produce. Um, there, there's so many technologies, as you say, it's, it's all coming together. You're kind of like the one missing piece of the puzzle. I, I'm so glad you found us. Yeah, so it's about uh, it's about making sure that uh, you have water and the availability of water. The innovations on water tech as well uh, mm -hmm. is amazing around the world. Uh, uh, and then you have water, energy, and the ability to retain uh, scarce resources in the soil and uh, cultivate healthy soil, even in places that have been seriously degraded. And there, I believe strongly in the in the potential of uh, desert farming. But I also, um, you know, think it's important to remember the fact of uh, of really slowing the spread of deserts as well. How important that is, yeah. uh, because deserts are spreading at a tremendous pace. I mean, uh, no, no, we're losing land right now. We're, we're... Worth of desert, uh, yeah. of, of, of fertile land turns to desert every hour. So, um, so uh, let, let's let's talk about the cost a little bit. I mean, it's just if I understand it right now, you kind of. You know, you probably have some kind of, I don't know, pyrolyzer or something like that uh, to, to heat up um, the, the, the clay and then mix it up. It, it doesn't, I mean, it's, it's, it's technical, obviously, probably done on a large scale, as I can imagine. Um, but it doesn't sound overly expensive. I mean, it sounds competitive from day one, or is it just missing something? Yeah, I mean, all technologies are kind of expensive in the beginning until you reach a scale of, uh, of things. Um, but basically, uh, basically, I mean, we have uh, we have an engineering pathway to get to quite good efficiencies in the near term. Uh, at the moment, with the slow, low scale that we've been using for validation projects and the first couple of commercial projects we'll be delivering in, in this coming year, I mean, that will be in the range of, uh, you know, uh, $2 per square meters or $20,000 per hectare. I mean, uh, that's still fairly expensive, but it's uh, it's still, you know, a very worthwhile investment. But because yeah. just the real estate value of that land will uh, will be higher uh, immediately after treatment. And then you have the yield increases and the cost reductions on uh, water and input resources to cultivate uh, what uh, what crops you're growing. Um, and we have a we have a pathway to uh, to get to a fraction of that cost uh, over uh, over a couple of years, right? right. So um, so so that we can really also make it affordable for the people who need it the most. Have you talked to the Saudis yet? Um, I mean, there are interests from uh, all over from all over the world, yep. uh, including from Saudi and all the GCC countries. Uh, of course, um, uh, since we are present in the UAE since 2018. Uh, uh -huh. A lot of uh, uh, businesses and um, government uh, uh, governments know of us in that region. Uh, we're also a part of the uh, Expo 2021 initiative now, um, uh, so uh, so we get a lot of uh, of uh, traction from uh, from the GCC countries. Excellent. Um, let's let's take this offline. I said I, I they have a few friends I really would like you to meet, um, but we can do this offline. And um, what's the best way to reach you? If somebody wants well, to buy your technology or invest, or I have to ask that question: Are you opening? F are you open for investors right now? I'm so excited! I almost um, forgot my, my key question here. <laughs> I get that. Do you question need money? Lot, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, to, to fuel uh, to fuel things and accelerate things, you need money. Fortunately, we are in a very good position at the moment. Uh, we did our seed uh, funding round, as I mentioned, that we closed in March this year. That gives us sufficient working capital to get to the next scaling stage. And we will be steering towards a Series A investment round um, uh, towards uh, late 2021, sort of uh, the end of 2021, beginning of 2022. Uh, so um, uh, be ready for that one. Yeah, very, very exciting. Uh, if you want to move faster, just let us know. Um, but maybe you won't need it. I mean, maybe you can bring a product out there also that, that works from day one. Definitely a very, very cool solution. If you don't mind, stay on a little bit because I think you're a final guest um, on the program, Oliver. Let me just double check. Correct. So I can just uh, say thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us tonight. 
Again, four very, very different, very exciting companies, uh, three different countries. Join us tomorrow for the best of tech from Israel. It's going to be super awesome. Five amazing company, and I think three out of them out of robotics, right? Oliver, where do you stand right now? Mm, two. Two out of them robotics. Going to be a lot of farming on there. Uh, in our partnership with TerraVenture Partners, it's going to be really awesome. And if you still want to come on board for February 16th, our biggest program, EX Venture, best of US and Canada, please do so. Reach out to us. It's going to be an amazing event. Probably 2,000 uh, you know, people listening to that. A lot of investors, a lot of partners. So this is really an amazing chance. Thanks, everybody, so much. We see you tomorrow night with our program from Israel. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.